So I was born in the nation's the United States of America <laughs> capital, yeah, Washington D.C., and uh, we lived in Virginia. And I think when I was about five, for job purposes, we moved to Southern California or the Bay Area, I think. And then we moved to Southern California, and then we moved back to Northern California. I was just a little guy. I don't even know what was going on, but I. I went to five elementary schools in California, north and south. Yeah, divorces, moves, careers, things. So moved all around and then um, moved, uh, went up to college in Northern California where my dad lived for a year or two. And then I joined the, the Navy and uh, went up. That's what got me to Washington. We'd be out in Washington. I was in a ace. Six squadron. So I had the best of both worlds. I got to be land based and be in steelhead country and and uh, and then deploy on the USS Kitty Hawk, go hang out in the Indian Ocean for a while and uh, back and forth there. And then, of course, I stayed in Washington and started my started my guide guiding career after after uh, the Navy. So well, that's where I grew up. <laughs> best of both worlds. And so you were already fishing at that point. It's not like you went to Washington and then started fishing. Oh, I, I fished since I was a little tiny guy, since I could walk. Yeah, I was always obsessed with fishing for sure. Through how it did, all. Yeah. How did that all happen? The fishing? Yeah. My dad, uh, it's kind of funny. My dad, um, it's not funny really, but <laughs> my my dad loved to fish. And we were kind of on some hard times when I was first, second grade. And uh, my parents got divorced and we lived in this teeny little town in Northern California called Stony Ford and uh, population 220. I know that because I just always remember seeing a little wooden sign in town and he had access to all these bass ponds for however, I don't private bass ponds. And uh, we used to go there. And when I say we were kind of on hard times, we went fishing a lot because we ate the fish and it was bass and bluegill and, um, it was pretty serious. You know, we'd, <laughs> we'd go out and he, I, I just, you know, he gave me a rod and let me do my thing. Um, but he was really serious about catching fish so we could eat them. <clears throat> and then moving forward, I remember just to the fun part of the story was a couple of years later, I'm like, dad, how come we don't go fishing anymore? Well, he had got a good job and was able to provide for us <laughs> protein. Uh -huh. So we didn't have, we weren't fishing as much. So I'm like, man, I liked it better when we were poor. So we were fishing all the time and shooting birds and eating them. <laughs> and, you know, um, of course, you're a little guy and me and my little sister, um, she's a year and a half younger than I. But, um, you know, we didn't we didn't feel destitute. We didn't. You know, you're with your parents and you trust them. And and uh, I had a ball that that those two years just sewed my whole the, the natural, you know, the nature part of deck and the outdoor part of deck. Um, just enthralled with everything we did. And we'd go out to these bass ponds and I remember all the dragonflies and there was huge bullfrogs just making all these noises and coots making all these noises and the bass were crazy. I mean, it was all top water stuff and just these silly little ponds full of cattails and just full of life and fishing was just amazing. So I got hooked then and then uh, moving on from there, fishing, um, you know, I'd beg my dad to take me. And then I kind of figured out how to do some stuff on my own and would ride my bike to some creeks around there and some other little ponds that I found myself. And then I uh, joined the Boy Scouts. In, uh, and then in the Boy Scouts, we got to go to the Sierra Nevada mountain range and some really cool places and fish for high, you know, high altitude cutthroats and brook trout. And I caught golden trout up near Mount Whitney and on these long extended backpacking trips. And I was just, just crazed. And now these kids would all follow me around because I was into it. You know, a lot of kids, they don't really know how to fish. They like to fish, but I know how to fish, you know, even just being a little guy, young guy. And uh, I remember my dad one time going back him when I started to really figure things out, I noticed how, how he tie his lures on and he just used a bunch of overhand knots. Oh, really? <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he just goes like, keep trying them on like that let me show you there's a knot for that and then pretty soon i was teaching him all that kinds of stuff and he was good he was gamey you know he was fishy but technically he didn't know a lot of stuff i remember too again we were, we were pretty poor these 
backing up, obviously, just I could talk about the bass ponds. You know, we talk about staying on for three hours. Yeah. I could talk about the bass ponds. <laughs> Go two for hours it. of it. Um, but he would, uh, he, he, I don't know how he got the lure. I don't know if he stole them or borrowed money or begged for it or whatever, but you know, he'd get like a Rap- Rapala, Rapala, Rebel lure or whatever. And, uh, um, you know, they were $3.50 back then in 1970. That was a lot of money. Now they're 15 bucks, but still, um, I remember him getting snagged and like going swimming, to get it. going out to, to get it. Yeah. Like going in the water. Cause you could not lose that lure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and which I thought was so cool. Look at my dad, man. <laughs> He's going, <laughs> going in the bass infested water and, <laughs> and getting the lure back. But, um, sounds extreme. It kind of was actually, uh, for a couple of years in our life. And again, I thought it was pretty cool. Like for instance, um, we heated our house one winter by burning our porch down piece by piece, two by four by two by four. He would just go out and pick a little off and bring it in and burn it and pick a little pretty soon. We didn't have a back porch. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Couldn't you go to yeah. the forest and, and pick up? Well, he did that too, but you needed gas to do that. Right. <laughs> I... Wow. But yeah, we did that too. Yeah. That was a brief, brief period of time, but yeah, did you I thought it was cool. Did your parents divorce during that or was it after that? Uh, yeah, no, that was, this was th- that whole time in Stony Ford, they had, they had got divorced. Yeah. So you so. lived with your dad? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You went yeah. with your dad? For, just for a couple of years. Wow. That's yeah, and, then my, and, then, and then my mom got her, got her act together and established some things in Sacramento and we, she got us, got us down to Sacramento and, and, uh, and then we just started that life. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty, that is quite interesting. I mean, obviously yeah, yeah. not having any money, but even, and this is going to come across horrible, especially because we've just what? officially met, but I don't know. There's so much backstory with going to going with your dad and my brain's wondering, was your mom okay? Um, oh yeah. Getting you guys. I mean, did, that must've had some, some emotion. I don't want to dig in pride. Oh too yeah. Much, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, sure. Sure. I know. And, and you never know how these are going to go. I've done a few podcasts and I've never really talked about that part of it, you know, a little bit. Oh yeah. Dad and I on the bass ponds, but um, I just start reflecting on it and, and plus, you know, it kind of makes you who you are too. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Like, very, first yeah, of all, are, very, yeah. obviously you're, are, are you okay? Is what I want to ask. Yep. Not <laughs> like, are you okay? <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay. for sure. Yeah, and your mom yeah. ended up being okay. Yeah, I sure did. Yeah. And so did my sister. Mm-hmm. Good. Yep. Good. Through, through it all. And yeah, it was, it was a bit tumultuous for sure. We, uh, again, through, like I said, I went to, to five different elementary schools, first through sixth grade. We moved around so much, but I got to do some cool fishing. I lived in Huntington beach in fifth grade mm-hmm. and, uh, the, the little Harbor, channel would uh there was like a oh i don't know if it was a canal or something but it's part of the huntington harbor and kid you not i used to go on my way to school on my bike you know we're i'm a gen xer right right on that cusp of baby boomer gen x so we lived pretty wild we were feral kids right yeah. and uh <laughs> and uh on my way to school riding my bike i'd stop at the harbor and i'd set i'd throw out a trot line tie it up to to a piling and throw out some 20 pound whatever I had and a big chunk of smelt that I caught the night before and put it on a weight and all day in school I just was dreaming about what was going to be on there and I'd get on my bike and I'd just haul ass to that spot and go out there and see what I caught and sometimes I, I scared myself really bad one time because I had to jump down on this little ledge right over the water and sometimes I you know I'd, I'd pull stuff in and it would be like the could call Tommy croakers or um, um, not the queen fish, but not your kind of queen fish um, in Australia. Uh, anyway, one day I pulled on this thing and it's just tugging back and tugging back. And it was huge. I'm getting a little nervous. I was excited and I got it up close and I saw this big <sighs> and I, I yelled shark and I let go and I climbed out <laughs> <laughs> and then uh <laughs> i went okay collect yourself i went back down i pulled it It was a big giant stingray <laughs> uh, but you know for a, for a kid in fifth grade wow pretty cool i mean it was exciting yeah. so it's a monster yeah 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 <laughs> so where did yeah. okay so you fished you graduated you went into 
the Navy. Yeah. Where does the fly fishing industry enter this mix? Okay. So uh, as far as uh, let's briefly tell you how I started fly fishing. So when I was a kid and I just fished for everything, I fished golf course ponds, all these places we moved, I always found places to fish and I'd sneak on the golf courses. And we all know that golf courses can be pretty dang good, right? Full of bass and tilapia and whatnot, bluegill, big bluegill. So we did all that. And, uh, um, and then the boy scouts, but I would fish whatever was most effective. Right. So when we go to the high Sierras, I use little Panther Martin spinners and do really well. I didn't like to fish with bait, but I would if I had to, but I prefer not to. And I found the spinning and lures and stuff at a young age. Uh, but I remember one night on one of those high mountain lakes um, that the fish were rising all over and they wouldn't eat my spinner. And that kind of, that, that ticked me off. I wasn't buying that. How could I not catch a fish on my spinner? That's when I'm like, okay, I need to fly fish. So I think I was 13 and I told my mom about it after that trip. I said, you got to get me something fly fishing. Please help me. I'll work it off, whatever. And uh, get me a fly fishing outfit. So I got this cheap little thing in a plastic wrap, you know, a little cardboard and plastic. And uh, I just kind of did it. I figured it out and I went out there and I caught fish the next time we went up to the mountains. So that, so then I stayed, I stayed using that whenever I needed to, but I thought it was pretty cool because it, you know, it worked. And then when I was about 21, I fully got bit by the fly fishing bug, just kind of on my own when I was in the Navy up in Washington. Oh. And uh, yeah, so I was just, I always been obsessed with it. And while I was in the, after the Navy, when I got out, I did go to Boeing for two years, worked at Boeing when they were just booming on the 747-400 program in Everett, Washington. And I already knew I wanted to be a fishing guide or be, do something to do with fishing at that point. So when I went to Boeing, um, <laughs> I would put up little flyers and and had this this one this one coworker of mine thought it was pretty cool my fishing thing I had pictures all in my big giant toolbox of all these fish I was catching, and uh, he he said hey man would you teach me and my couple of my buddies how to how to cast and stuff and then of course the lights went on for me I'm like whoa so I made this full blown class and put flyers all around Bowie and I got permission to do it and we signed up like 18 people oh my god and I think I. Yeah, I think I charged them like $10 a piece. <laughs> and we went to this guy's house and I gave him a full fly fishing school. And I'm still learning myself, obviously, even how to teach or anything. But I got really supercharged out of that. And we did a few more of those things. And and then uh, in my, I was a member of a local fly club, Fidalgo Fly Fishers, uh, out of Anacortes, Washington. And uh, um, since I was into it and everybody kind of knew that I – figured some things out and they asked me to do a club meeting and I was beside myself, man, I'm just this 20 something year old kid and they want me to be, and there's all these old guys, you know, yeah. <laughs> we called them the Fodago, I called them the Fodago fly wisher. Scott O'Donnell and I were in that together actually. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We had met in the Navy and kind of hit it off, fished a lot together, um, which is a whole nother story. There's three more hours, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Uh, so they asked me to do a meeting on how to fish coronamids. So I was fishing a, a lot of coronamids on this. Pa it's called Pass Lake. Maybe you heard of it. Oh, it's yeah. Very, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. that what you were and, primarily uh, fishing for was trout? Had you discovered salmon and steelhead at this point? Uh, I, my, I had caught steelhead in Northern California, uh, but I wasn't a steelheader yet. Got it. Um, so, yeah, it, while, I was, while I was on that island, Whidbey Island, I fished for sea run cutthroat. Uh, we did cat, we did fish silvers in the salt water. Um, I went out a few times in the salt in a boat, but we'd fish from shore and, and catch silvers. And I caught some Kings from shore, some little bl winter black mouths. And then, uh, but I was pretty obsessed with that past Lake and, and, uh, and going over there and I could ride my bike to it. I could, in fact, I got, I got, uh, my first mountain bike. I love mountain biking still, uh, in 1984 when the mountain bikes were just a new thing. And I, it was the first time I got any credit, it, it built my credit. I went to the, the local credit union and took out a loan and oh. <laughs> went and bought a mountain bike, just not to go mountain biking, just to go fishing. <laughs> my mode of transportation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so you're at the so club. Anyway, so I cut you I off. So you're the, teaching did, chronomics. The, yeah, I did the club meeting. And again, I just got this super high, super charged and everyone loved it. And I was like, oh, this is great. So I've done the classes and I've done this. And what am I going to do? I've got to, I've got to make a living in fishing somehow. And um, so when I'm working at Boeing after the Navy, I thought I'm going to build some capital capital, maybe buy a little house or buy a boat or something. I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, um, and I didn't even know if I, I, you know what, I take that back. I didn't know for sure I was going to guide. I just knew I had to do something in it, which guiding would be a natural thing, a natural uh, path. Uh, but the local sporting goods store, it wasn't even a fly shop yet. The local sporting goods store, Ed Sports Shop on the, on the Skagit River in Mount Vernon, they, uh, they called me and asked me if I would guide one day because the usual guides that they used were, <clears throat> this was steel. I was already into steelheading at this point. I'm kind of, kind of bouncing around. But you're asking about the professional part, right? So I'm already addicted to steelhead. I did my thing. North Fork, still a Guamish, got into it, started catching fish like crazy, became obsessed. Actually, when I caught my first steelhead, I said, I'm never going to fish for trout again, ever. It's just, you know, boom. And, uh, and I didn't for a long time. <laughs> I was just obsessed with steelhead. And anyway, they called they they called me and asked me if I wanted to guide this guy because they couldn't find anybody. I go, well, I'm not a guy. I don't have a guide license. And they said, just take him out. He was a guy was from South Africa, and uh, on business. And they said, just take him out, and you know, you're just fishing with a friend, whatever. So I took him out, and I took him on the Stillaguamish in May, early May. So this so we're still some winter runs around, and it just re no, it was open back then. Anyway. Got two, two wild, nice, big, 10, 12 pound, chrome bright, wild, late winter run fish. And I was ecstatic. I said, that's it. I was foaming at the mouth just that I did this thing and that I actually guided. So I just went from there and I, I found out how to get a job in Alaska and I thought I'll go to Alaska and I'll work up there and I'll learn a whole bunch of stuff and I'll recruit people to be a, to, for, to fish steelhead. And the Skagit River in those days was the catch and release season, you know, February, March, April was was on and it was good and it was happening. So um, I did that, got a, bought a Labro drift boat, got the job in Alaska. Prior to going to Alaska, I don't know, you know, John Farrar, he was guiding on the Skagit then. And I told him, again, 20 something year old me, I'm like, hey, John, I'm guiding now and and I, it'd be really cool if I could help you. And, man, he started giving me clients right away. It's awesome. Trusted me. So I took these people out on the Skagit and brand new to it. And we're catching steelhead. And, and John's like, hmm, <laughs> wow. How would you do today? And he goes, nothing. Where are you fishing? <laughs> you know, I just was all over the place. But that's part of being a young guy, too. You know, a lot of the I'm, – I'm just covering everything. Just shuck. I, I used to kill my clients. I didn't realize it back then. You know, and the older guys, you kind of, we pick and choose our spots. We know where we're going. We know what time to be there. You, right? You know all that. But, man, I was just shotgunning everywhere, so I was picking up fish. And then I went to Alaska and uh, um, just and, and got Edward, grabbed him and said, you know, he, when I got the job in Alaska, he's like, can I think I can get a job? He was living with me, actually. What? Um, Hang on. So you guys are yeah. buddies. Yeah, we're all over the place here. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, actually, Scott and Ed and my then wife, we all lived in a little house together. Um, it, it, she, she wasn't too thrilled about it, but, you know, <laughs> my friends needed a place to stay. So we had this, you know, my house became the fly tying fisherman steelhead or flop house. And we had a ball and learned a lot of stuff together. Um, so were you the first of that crew to get into the industry as such? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, you know, in that, at that, at the level, you know, again, I, 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 I got the, I got the job in Alaska and Scott and Ed are like, how do you do that? Can we do that? And I said, I think you can. Here's what I did. So Ed and I went up and then Scott got hired at a different lodge uh, that first year. And then Ed and I were at Katmai Lodge together. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. So then yeah. guiding for the, such, it's a short season, right? How long was the season? Uh, uh, it, it, on the Skagit? No, no, in Alaska. The, uh, Alaska? Oh, for, uh, we would go up in late May to help build, you know, set up camp and build buildings, and we'd go till September. So it's a good long season. It's three, three, four months. 
And then you come back and you guide in Washington. At this point, were you out of, were you, were you done in the Navy and done with Boeing? Yeah, done at Boeing. Yeah, I, I, I dove in. Yeah, I quit, I quit Boeing. My, my plan at Boeing was two years and two years to the month I left Boeing. There was a lot of guys that were pretty resentful of me, you know, guys that were making their living there and stuck in that factory life and the security and the insurance like what 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 makes you so special that you can leave here and and guys would walk by my my work area and go you'll be back six months six months i'm like no way man i'm gonna make this happen so i went to i i I started to establish my my skagit season then i went to alaska and then after alaska my you know george cook he had me lined up with this uh, on uh, the Grand Ronde to work for Little Creek. And uh, I just got lucky and fell into that timing it was good. So then I would do the right after Alaska, I would go guide steelhead on the Grand Ronde um, into, into November. And then I'd come back, take a month off, watch foot, lay on my ass and watch football and then start up the winter season. <laughs> when did you even have time? I mean, you would, I would have said June, but you'd be in Alaska. November, there's still fish. December, when did you get time? Oh, so we we would go November, December, yeah, okay. and then, yeah, and then actually, you know, the uh, when I when I started really rolling in Alaska, I would end my I would end my um, Skagit season on April 31st, and <clears> have <throat> the whole month of May and June. Well, George Cook was doing Isaac Ranch Lakes back then, and. Uh, he lined, I had a ton of work there. So May, May and June, I was, well, through the month of May before I'd go to Alaska, I had a bunch of days out at Isaac Ranch too. And then I'd go to Alaska. So I had a pretty good lineup, but, but half of November and then December and, you know, January, you were not exactly lighting it up either. I would have a, a couple trips here and there, but February through the end of October, I was hot, hot and heavy, when which was you- great because I, I made it work. Absolutely. Year round. Yeah. Uh, and you never had to just be a shop guy. You were always on the water. I had, uh, I had one part, part of my little story about getting into this. Yeah. I had one or two winters where I would work at Abbott Angler, the original Abbott Angler. Oh, right. Yeah. Tom Darling. Um, and, and, and well, and what I did there, that was part of my recruiting, you know, getting guys to go steelheading. And uh, I did some steelhead schools too, some you know steelheading 101 schools, and uh, so I think I did that for a one or two winters. Yeah, and I even did the fly tying thing too. Remember, like you said, December and January we're not guiding a whole bunch, so I did the the the, the um, fly tying thing, and I regretted that when I got my first big order. I was so excited, but then I had to tie them. You know, it's like we well, want 18 dozen green butt skunks. Nope. 12 next. dozen sky coma <laughs> sunrises. I'm like, oh man, now I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, that actually segues me perfectly into my next question. Because at that time, what are we talking now? Are we talking 90s or are we still in the 80s here? Uh, so all that, my first, my first guiding full time was 90. Right. 1990 it was that first year I did some Skagit trips. Alaska. And then it was 91 when I got to go to the Grand Ronde as well. So, yeah. What about when you started fly fishing for steelhead? What era was that? So that was mid eighties. Okay. So that's what I'm wondering about in the eighties when, when, because winter steelhead weren't really popularized until quite late. Right. I I mean, I recall reading that didn't they even in the fifties, not necessarily believe that a winter steelhead would take, can you walk me through a little bit of that timeline and, and how uh, you wove your way into it? Yeah. So, so, so my knowledge of it, uh, well, it certainly started with, with, um, when I, when I got to the Skagit and they were talking about this catch and release season and there were big wild winter steelhead that was, and, and there was just, there was guys up there doing it. Uh, but then my, my education on, uh, you know, and the water's warmer than, you know, Mar- March and April, but the dead of winter stuff. Yeah. The, it, it was, it was, uh, not thought of too highly, right. You wanted the warm water of summer to, where the fish are more aggressive. However, in Northern California in the fifties, they right. were doing it. 
yeah, yeah, that's kind of where it started. And that's when they were making the rolling their line, their silk lines and graphite to help sink them and making those 30 foot shooting heads. And, and, uh, I, I ate Trey, Trey's book, Trey Combs book, the steelhead fly fishing and flies, the, the paperback one that came out in, I think 74. Um, I, I, I could probably recite the whole thing still to memory the whole back part of the book, the, the, all, the, all the flies and all the history in there. And uh, in fact, we used to have a fun game up in Alaska. The guys would hold, hold up a picture of it and hide the caption. And I would tell them what the caption said, <laughs> every oh single picture God. in there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So when you were reading that book, did you, was there anything that was glaringly obvious to you that could be improved upon? Oh, then? Yeah. Well, yeah. Y- y- <sighs> Not, yeah, not, not yeah, as far as the writing goes, as far as the fishing goes. Did you ever no, have not these- the writing. I mean, no, I know what you're talking about, the fishing. Well, one thing that I, 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 you know, just, I guess I was kind of born into it was the bigger flies for winter. You know, a lot of those flies were smaller and, and uh, they had a couple, uh, uh, Al Knutson had a big white marabou. That was the biggest fly in the book. Um, but everything was pretty small. And, and, uh, I always felt like the, even back when that they liked bigger flies, um, in the wintertime. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the to the uh, Northern California, I think was where it was kind of all born. The winter steelhead thing, and then in Washington, there was a group of guys in the fifties, and that was um, uh, Wes Strain and Ralph Wall, and Al Knutson, all those old guys, and they figured some stuff out on the Skagit, and they were doing this. They they figured some stuff out. And I guess that Ralph Wall, and I was always intrigued with all this stuff. There was, I guess, Field and Stream magazine had a big, a big contest every year, you know, the, who could get the biggest fish. And they knew that there was big fish in the Skagit. And the Northern California guys was always claiming the, 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 the award for the biggest winter steelhead caught. And uh, I remember Ralph Wall saying, I talked to him before he passed away and spent some, some quality time with him at his house. And he said, man, I'm, when he figured out how to catch those Skagit fish, he was going to show those Northern California boys a thing or two. And sure enough, he did it. You know, he got some big, huge steelhead. So that, they're, they're the guys that really cracked that code for winter fishing. But by, by the time I got into it, it was, you know, even in the, in the 80s, it was accepted. And there was, you know, methods and lines already and people doing it. Not a ton. When I started fishing the Skagit, um, you, if you saw a car, you knew whose car it was, you know, parked on the road. And if you, if you found a fly on the river, you, I could, I, I knew whose fly it was. Right. So things have changed. Yeah. What do you think they did? Just, I, I mean, I'm excited to get back into kind of the eighties, nineties, but okay. when, when was, when was the Knutson West strain sort of era? Was that the 50s, 60s? Yes. Mm-hmm. And what do you yep. think they did primarily to have the, the, you know, everything shift in fly fishing for winter steelhead specifically. Do you think it was the flies, lines, presentation? Oh, oh, yeah. So all the above, but I think, I think, um, I think a lot of it was, dis- was discovering the water, uh-huh. the big bars, those big, slow moving bars where, you know, those, they, they knew, they knew how to, to angle their cast down in tight line swing. Um, and you know, as well as I do, um, that the most important part of presenting a fly to steelhead I, is, is speed, speed over depth, right? I think fly speed is the most important thing. And those guys did try and get deep too, but they can only go so deep, right, with what they're doing. But if you get on that good water, which they found them good two to you know three, four foot big wide bars, and I think that's one of the things that really helped them. I do know that they did, uh, they um, paint, they got some lead paint, and paint it on their, on their, uh, their lines to help them sink. Yep. And then, you know, they didn't add weight to them, but I know Ralph Waugh was using the stout hooks and then he, you know, just used floss and real thin stuff. So that would help penetrate and sink a little bit, but they were tight lines, you know, and they were just using 30 foot heads. So they didn't have a big belly section in their fly line. So they would cast straight across and mend it out like we do and dig it in. They just had to hit the angle, right? And hang on for the most part with those lines. So they'd wait out to their chest and 
quarter downstream and hang on. So they got some depth. But I think that the the, the runs they fished was what, what they cracked mostly. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Especially yeah. when you go from a mentality of conventional fishing and gear fishing. And you're so used to fishing pocket water and troughs, you know. Troughs, yeah. And then to have to wrap your head around the whole fly aspect. Obviously, one of the things that would probably be last to change after you change gear, flies, et cetera, would be the water that you go to. So, yeah, I could see. Yep. I see what you mean. I'm following. Okay, yep. so fast forward to the 90s. And it's you nefarious characters. Okay, so this, I've got a ton. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to stick here in the 90s for a bit. I've got questions. Wait, oh, no, you're, you're, it's your baby. I'm just, I'm just here. It's your world. <laughs> I'm living in it. <laughs> okay, so you're out there. You're going for a winter steelhead. At this point, was there any, what were the politics back then? Were you allowed uh, to keep fish? Oh, so, so our, yeah, during, yes, yeah, during the, um, okay, first of all, on, on the winter, the winter fishing, I fished the still, North Fork still Guamish, I fished the Skagit, I fished the Skycomish, and then, of course, the Skagit, the Sauk River is the principal tributary, so it's, to me, it's all the same, so, Sauk, Skagit, um, and that was all within an hour of where I lived. Um, in the, in the winter, true winter months, uh, December, January, February, you could keep two hatchery fish. Oh, so there was a hatchery um, there too at this time. Yeah, long-standing hatchery. hatchery okay. Hatcheries on all, yeah, winter winter hatcheries on all those rivers, and uh, you could keep a couple of those, and uh, if you wanted, and then wild fish. Um, I believe in the regulations, you could keep them, but I never did. I've never killed a wild fish in my life. In fact, you know, my I've killed a few hatchery fish to eat, but even those, I just put them back. You got to kill those things. Well, no, I might need them tomorrow. You know, <laughs> fish for them. So, um, I always love wild fish. But uh, the 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 big thing that was so cool was the catch and release season on the Skagit and Sock rivers. So it would go from March fifteenth to the end of April. So just a six week six week um, season where it was single barbless hook selective fisheries. We call it single barbless hook, no bait. Um, so that, you know, pretty cool and, uh, all catch and release. You couldn't keep any of these fish. And, um, that's, that's the, the big, the big true Skagit and sock wild fish. Most of them come in into that river February through May. Right. So March and April are just peak times. And you just like so many of the rivers in BC, you know, the, yeah, you, you know, I, I fish the, 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 um, Skeena and the, Kalem and the Kitimat and all those in April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So same, same, same kind of thing. And then, um, um, on the still Guamish, we fished all, all the summer runs there where we, except for the, you know, around Deer Creek, there's a little cool little native, well, uh, wild, wild fish, but a lot of hatchery fish in the, in this, in the stilly back in those days. So in the summertime, we'd go fish for those and they were fun. They were aggressive and good fish. Um, on the Grand Ronde, when I guided out there and fished out there, that was selected fisheries as well, which is great. And a single barbless hook, no bait. And then, uh, after, well, you, 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 you guide me. We're in the nineties. We're in the nineties, but were there any closures? You know how now it's almost like you don't know if this year is going to be open, if that year is going to be closed. Was it just for the entire decade? Was it open for guiding? Nope. Nope. The first closure I experienced was in 1992 on the Skagit. No way. Yeah. yeah. They on closed that season. Of, it was a yeah, fish numbers. They they, yeah. They just didn't get the escapement. They, you know, and there's always politics involved with that too. But yeah, 92, a lot of people don't realize that 92, they closed it. And, uh, like, well, man, well, I knew the sky Comish pretty well. So I said, well, I'm just going to have to move my operation down down there and I, I you know you were nervous about it god they close this river they're going to close it next year but it sounded like it was a one-time thing and i, I kind of forget the details and uh i thought well i'm just going to move it down to the sky comish and i moved it down to the sky comish and oh my gosh <laughs> it was insane the fishing was amazing for the same brand of fish big wild winter fish in march and april it was it was like on the skagit uh, which, you know, I, I, I love the Skagit and I would, if I had to catch, you know, a fish on the Skagit versus any other river, I would want to catch one on the Skagit. I get sock and Skagit. Those fish are 
pretty extra special, like the Dean and the Thompson, you know, just a little extra. Uh, but the Skycoma is fish for big, beautiful wild fish and really easy water to fish. Um, but my lifetime for the boat on the Skagit, two anglers, one or two or whatever, not my own fishing, just the was 0.8 a day. That's sea, 0.8 grabs, you know, fish on a day, which is pretty good. <laughs> and uh, um, um, on the Skycomish that year, it was like 3.3. Er, uh, yeah, so it was almost like summer steelheading for these winter fish. It was just crazy. So although I was bummed the Skagit was closed, um, I was just having a ball on the Skycomish. So it was so much so that next year when the Skagit was open – I stayed on the sky until guiding until March and, and then moved up to the Skagit in April. I think I did that for a couple of years till they closed the sky comish. Oh. So that was the, yeah, then they just closed it and, it, and that one was never going to open. It still hasn't for that, for that season. Yeah. And that, I don't know what happened there. You know, we, you know, we all know the reasons for all these things, right? Um, mo- mostly, uh, whether it's wherever it is, you know, I, from the Skeena on down to Northern California, right. There's, everything's kind of in trouble. That's yeah. La la la. Um, <laughs> did you have a year where everything was <laughs> shut when you were stuck for income? Yeah. So, um, it happened. The, the Skagit closed and then the Sky Comish was closed. That would have been 1999. I think it was 19, maybe 2000, 2000, they closed the Skagit and now the Sky Comish is closed. And I wasn't going to go out to the peninsula. First of all, I didn't want to do my, my guests a disservice because I didn't know those rivers. I've been there, you know, and I could figure stuff out, but I, I, I don't want to just go and, you know, figure out where all the boat ramps are in one day and, and just, you know, fake it and get through and learn as I go. I did that enough when I was younger. Uh, but at that point I just didn't want to do it. Plus I knew everybody was going to go there. You know, that was, and they did, everyone flocked to the peninsula. So what I did was I threw something together and put together a casting two hand casting tour. And I went for like six weeks and I just lined up all these shops all over the North or the East coast and the great lakes area and just went on, went out there and hung out for like literally for six weeks and just went from shop to shop. And I had a ball and made all kinds of friends and made a little money and got, got through and kind of established myself over there. It was pretty fun. When did the two hand thing come into play in your life? Oh, 1989. I put my, I cast my first one. So when I started my guiding for Steelhead in 1990, I was one of the six people when sage came out with the original 9140-4 brownie yeah. they had six prototypes yeah and i was one of the six that got one and i was like why would you give one to me i i'm not you know you know they said we're going to give these we're giving these rods to to influential two-handed casters or something and i said well first of all i'm not influential i I just barely started guiding and i don't even know how to cast it and they said, well, you'll learn and you will be. And I kind of took that to heart. I said, God, that's pretty cool. That's pretty Who's they? Was this, was this Sage or Sage, Maxwell? Yeah, Sage. Okay. No, Sage. Sage, gotcha. Sage, Sage, Sage. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, in 1990, they gave me that rod with the funny little handle, the Harry Lemire handle on it. And uh, Wait, what do you I mean Harry out. Lemire handle? Sorry. I'm oh, fast. Me, this is, okay. you're so right in my peak you know right now. Else. Yeah, yeah. So, they, so the the history of that, would you know jim green was designing the rods for sage back then and harry lemire and bob strobel were were they were all and, and jim were all friends and jim had a, a place on the on the lower on the mouth of the grand rond and they would go out there and fish all fall and and uh and play with rods and you know always jim was always experimenting so they came up with that two-handed rod um for Harry and Bob, just wanted something a little softer than what the Norwegian sticks, you know, the Scandinavian sticks they were making sage was. They had a 16 foot 10 weight, a 15 foot 10 weight, and a 14 foot 9 weight, and they were all fast, super fast rods. And those came out like in 84, 85. Anyway, so they made this rod, and Harry wanted a handle that was just like a, a regular single handed 
handle on top and then the long handle on the bottom. So the reel was way up here. It was really funky. Yeah, go online and look it up sometime. So you got this little handle here and the reel's up high and low hand. And they did that for like the first ones were were that way about a year. And the only person that liked them was Harry. <laughs> It's the first the first two handed rod I ever cast was a ninety one forty on the Thompson. Yeah, but when you're, it was, but I don't. It wasn't the it it was it was not the original. It wasn't that hand. Yeah, no, huh? they did one year of that and then they went to uh, a regular uh, handle. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so yeah. of the six, do you remember who they were? Uh, I remember it was myself, John Hazel, down on the shoots, um, John Farrar, Al Burr. Um, I, I used to be, I'm down in Southern Oregon. I might've been Al Perryman. Um, and then the sixth one, I, I actually forget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. But okay. The, so, you, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say the ones that were close to me though, were, were me, John, John Hazel. Uh, and then I knew Albert a little bit too. So what were you supposed to put on this thing? Okay. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so prior to us getting to the two hand first of all when i first you know i i was tell this story so um fishing i feel like that first of all i know you agree you, when you're still at fishing you want your fly to come across slow right fish get it tight early and come across slow um so we wait out to here with our single handed rods and we bomb it out there as far as we can. And what do we do? We reach and we hold it out, hold it out. Because when I say slow, I forgot to say this part, that, that, that the way I picture it is the closer that rod tip is to the fly, the slower it's going to come across. Right? So we're reaching out and hanging on and trying to slow it way out there. So when I first put a two hander in my hand, I popped it out there. Whoa. I just overhead it. I couldn't believe it. How much slower drift I got. Because my rod tip's that much further out, right? So it's like, well, that's this makes sense on this big river. This is wonderful. So we're still waiting out to here and doing this, trying to slow it, right? So they, so I was attracted to the two-hander, not because of the sexy cast and the no back cast. Like we didn't even know how to do that as a fishing tool. Man, I was just sold. It was just amazing. Now I'm catching fish way out there getting grabs further out there because my fly is fishing slower. They're not having to follow it around until it gets to the sweet spot. And the sweet spot is sweet because that's where the fly swims the best, whether you screw up the cast or not, right? But if you can get it out there and hold it. And, uh, oh, so the line. So prior to to that, uh, we fished our single-handed rods, <clears throat> and we would make our own shooting heads. Take – for instance, so the Teeny 200 was a popular line back then, and we would take that and chop the head off, splice in about 10 feet of, like a, from a 10 weight floater. We didn't weigh anything, just about that much, 10 feet. You splice it in, cut that that the, I think those the sinking portion of those lines. I think it was about 24 feet. We'd cut them back to 15, 18 feet, splice it in, and then you could just strip in, get to that belly section. Roll it out in front of you, pick it up, one false cast, right? And just shoot that, shoot it out there. And then once it got out there, unlike the Ralph Walls and the old guys on in the 50s in, in Northern California, we weren't at just at the mercy of the angle because we had that floating belly section and a shorter head. It wasn't 30 feet, so we could mend it and steer it around and pretty fish it pretty, pretty, a lot more effective and more, more under more control. So then when we did the two-handed rods, and I can't take credit for this, Harry showed me, um, he just took the same lines we were making and made them bigger. I took our single-handed lines and made them bigger. And when I think about it, nowadays, back then it was just our line, but what, what do you think we did? We took, we took on this 9140, we took for there to make it bigger, we, we got a, a floating section from a 12-weight. We would buy, me and my buds would all pitch in and buy 120 foot uh, double taper for two handed casting in England or Scotland. And uh, we chop it up, each take a chunk of like 17 to 20 feet, and then just, you know, make our running line and then add our sink tip. So we got this big fat belly section. And then our 15 foot, what did we, what did we effectively come make? 
Skagit line. Big Skagit line. Right? But at this yeah. point, you're not factoring in a spay no. cast. You're just factoring in loading the rod in an overhand. Loading the rod. Overhand yep. Load, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And then and then we started to learn how to cast a little bit. Harry knew a little bit. And I, so I, 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 him and Bob kind of knew the motions a little bit. So I watched them. Okay, you stick it on the water. And then we had a book, uh, Arthur Oglesby book from England. And there was just like one page where he talks about a double spay and there's this line flying all over the place in this picture. <laughs> and he talks about, uh, I remember him saying, and then when you come forward, you feel like you're breaking the rod. You want to break the rod. And like, Ooh, man, that's not going <laughs> to, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> not with this short little line. And, and again, I didn't know. I just, we were out there trying to break the rod. I'm like, no, how about we just smooth it out? <laughs> so we started figuring out, it was more like a little slingshot, you know, it wasn't, I, 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 I I understood just because, you know, being fishy and knowing how to cast already that if I got that, if I got that fly up here opposite my target, then I could make a, like a live line roll cast and pop it out. So kind of figure that out. Right. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then pretty soon we're, we're doing it and trying to learn them. Uh, Ed, Ed and I laughed at about four years into it, you know, and we're on the river 250, 300 days a year between guiding if I wasn't guiding, I was fishing all the time, right? And uh, four years before we got any kind of consistency at that many, at the, you know, with the two-handed trying to learn stuff, because there's so many variables and we don't know anything about it. We're just trying to figure it out. And I, so I tell my students now, I'm like, in the, the, in the first hour, you're, you're where I was a year into it, you know, 250 days a year on the water <laughs> trying to figure stuff out, because now we know we have lines and we know how to teach it and we know how to cast. And, so back then, that was our line. And then people started coming up with all their own little formulas. And it didn't, it, it, it didn't mean anything. Because if you have that chunk of floating section, it's just a big garden hose, right? right. Guys like, well, yeah. And I, and I appreciate it. Guys <laughs> have to think over things like, yeah, I've got two foot of taper in there. If I splice in a little 10 weight, then I'm like, hmm. <laughs> just, <laughs> I just put my stuff on and go, you know. <laughs> and got it out there. <laughs> all this technical stuff it just it loaded the rod and and then from there i you know i i, I learned a lot more and, and yeah do you remember the first time when you went okay larger rod thicker line flies and then you decided to try to experiment with the heaviest flies that you could cast and i'm asking because so i remember when i had that moment of wait a second so i've just replaced my single hand rod with this two-handed rod this line is way thicker than that line. Yeah. And it took me a little bit, it took me a few days of fishing to go, well, hang on. Why am I fishing this? I think it was a green butt skunk. Yeah. Why don't I try this? And it was this horrendous, big ostrich packed rock star thing with weighted yeah. eyes. Do you remember yeah. that moment of let's try these big flies? Yeah. So, you know, the, when I, when I started doing it, the, there was no intruders yet that we hadn't we hadn't gone big the, a big fly to us was a marabou or a big general practitioner right and then ed, ed came up with the intruder and he's the one that went bonkers with bigger and bigger um did so the intruder I, come before all the rock stars and those big the big because articulated flies still existed before the intruder right yeah there there was yeah the, the 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 articulated leeches were yeah for sure they were there before the intruder but when you talk about all the ostrich and all that made in the lead and eyes made me think of an intruder style fly but yeah we had the the uh the um articulated leeches which i played with so yeah i did do that and uh, now that you talk about it and we used rabbit strips too Yes. We would uh, take a couple turns of rabbit strip and then just make these big, huge, big, long things that would be hard to throw on a single hander. And, uh, and I, 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 uh, I jumped to a, to a 15 foot 10 weight after a while. And I just, I just loved the power of that thing. and was just bombing them out there. And, and, uh, then I would put some pretty big stuff on for sure. Yeah. But, you, but the first time you started fishing with really big flies, was that, did you, I guess my question before we go down the revelation, when you realized, okay, I can turn over these huge flies now. Did, were you fishing big flies when you were still only on single hander or did you have the moment of realization after you switched to two handers? Um, I tried to fish bigger flies with the single hander. So I, I would push that to the limit 
to my limits. And then certainly my limits were extended uh, when I got to the two hander, but I was kind of always, well, I, I can just tell you straight up my, my, when I was fishing single hander, my number one um, winter fly was just marabou's you know you spun marabou's and i would put them on a on a on a one odd or two odd whatever the hook was back then tiemco or and then i used some of those alec jackson hooks as well but for the winter fish i usually use the tiemcos and the bigger stuff but two odds and just get the biggest piece of marabou i could and then i started getting into prawns and i would get a partridge end size two odd partridge end that's a pretty big fly and make the prawn about that big you were making them that so, big back then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa. I was, so, yeah, I started getting, like you said, when I got the two-hander, I started tying some big, I still have some of that old stuff I just kind of hung on to. It's pretty fun to look at. What did your catch rate do? Did you notice a, a significant increase in your catch rate? Um, I want to say yes, but I, I, I don't believe that it really did. It just felt good. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I always tell this story to people. And I remember back then when, when the intruder kind of took off and, and, uh, Ed was getting them bigger and bigger. I never really did a lot of the intruder. I kind of like my hybrid sort of old school, you know, Atlantic sand, D flies and practitioners and that kind of thing. And kind of a, a hybridization of those with some modern stuff, but, um, I, I watched people get so confident in the big flies to where that they couldn't fish anything else. And when I say people, I'm talking like, you know, weekend guys and, and some of the client types and, you know, guys, all of us that are on the river all the time, we all have our own program, right? We have our, our thing that we like to do, but the, to the casual ang angler, they started feeling like they had to have these huge flies. And I had, I remember showing people pictures of ed ed and i fishing and ed with his little tiny flies on the evening in the skagit when he called the black nymph it wasn't a nymph but it was just it was like literally that big with a little black body and a little spade hackle and a tail that's all it was ed and then he had one he called his hackle tip and it was like a offshoot of a winner's hope but it was literally like on a size two hook with a couple of little hackle tips and a little silver body, tinsel body, catching fish on this gadget. So I don't know, you know, big it's flies are, are help, right? it's confidence. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And the assumption that something bigger is going to result in more attention, but you're right. Cause I remember when I really got into it, it was, you know, go big or go home. And then yeah. I started to, as the water got clear and especially being on the bulkly, I would downsize. Yeah. And then when I was catching yep. more fish on Lady Caroline's, there was this whole yeah. moment of, okay, okay, okay. So maybe I was young and stupid and <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not even being young and stupid. It's just like, I, I know about the time you got into it and, and you, you got into it when bigger was better for sure. Everyone was getting, you're the person I'm talking about, bigger you know, it's like yep. the, the confidence you just, you don't have to do it. And, 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 and it's fine if you did, the only reason that I was on a little crusade as a guide was people had to be able to throw those things. Even with the two hander, you know, you had to have your shit together and get a real good anchor placement and get a really nice load on that rod and not stroke it down to get that baby to pop, you know, yeah. to lift, to lift out. So I'm like, okay, hey, you're struggling to cast. I need you to fish. <laughs> so let's use a little smaller fly, which was still big. Yeah. I'm going to ask you something yeah. that is on the tip of my tongue, but I, I almost didn't ask it, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So the whole Ward, O'Donnell, McCune, did I have that right? Who yep. else was in there? Jerry, I guess. Did you, yeah, Jerry French. Did you, I mean, I feel like you were in there, but obviously with a lot of their branding and marketing, the Mo tips, for example, um, did you ever feel any sort of resentment? Were you left out on purpose? Did you? Oh, no. No, no, I never felt resentment, and I and I I wasn't left out on purpose. I could have been right in there with. I just the, the, there's timing of things and what I was doing, and like I said, I never, I never really, I don't want to say bought into the intruder thing, but I I wasn't a big intruder guy. So so Jerry and 
Jerry and Ed, which, you know, those guys were my, we fished together all the time. Um, but they were, they were doing all kinds of experimenting on their own that I just, I wasn't interested in for whatever reason <clears throat> doing my own thing. And when that, when that whole I'm trying to think of the timing of that, I think that Mo tip and those guys see McCune during my days in the nineties, he, he wasn't around on the schedule. I did. not He wasn't part of that, part of that program. Um, those guys all met later. I think when uh, Scott started guiding on the Grand Ron, I think he met him, got him working for him on the Grand Ron somehow. And then Ed started working with him. And I think by that time, I may have been, I may have moved on maybe. Because I think the Motip came out after I left left that scene. Um, but yeah, no resentment at all whatsoever. No. Your book came out first, I think. Because I remember, I always had known who you were, obviously. By the way, you've been on my list of like top 10 podcast people since I started this podcast. And if anyone's wondering why I haven't had you on yet, I was just so desperate to get you in person, but at some point I have to be like, okay, I okay. I, I just cannot wait anymore. I have to make this happen. Yeah, well, that's cool. I'm glad we did. I'm glad I was happy when you, well, I, I do remember the very first year you did, you started anchored podcast. You, you got a hold of me and we tried to do it and you didn't realize I had moved to moved away from Washington. So yeah. yeah. So I was glad that you, I figured with COVID, maybe you were doing them on the Zoom now. Yeah, yeah we're finally making it happen. But your yeah. book for me was a major pivotal moment in the entire end. At the time, especially, it was an expensive book for you know yeah. a young person. And I just, Absolutely. it was worth every single penny. So let's talk oh, a little bit about this book. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that with me. That's, that's flattering. Nice to oh, know. It, our whole scene. <laughs> I mean, I just remember there are two points growing up. I say growing up, but as a young woman in the industry that really... I, I will never forget. And it was when your book came out and when Ed's DVD came out, I wasn't, oh, yes. I wasn't so much into the DVD thing. Cause at that point I had already had, I was really stuck in, I guess both times I was stuck in my ways, but I was just really excited about your book and all of the presentation tactics that were laid out so clearly for us to see. Mm -hmm. And nice. both, both times my group of friends, there was this big, you know, frenzy towards your book and Ed's DVD. So Ed's DVD. <laughs> your book. Talk cool. to me about this. How did it all start? Uh well, um, I I uh, I started writing and going way back to ninety three, I think. We were up on the up on the uh, Alagnac River in Alaska. We were doing the silvers on surface and we came up with that wog. I think polywog and surface flies and Nicomato from fly fishing and salmon trout still had her, you know, a motto publications caught wind of it and wanted to come up and see what it was all about. And so he came up and fished with us and we just, you know, it was carnage with the wogs on the surface and just so much fun. And all the guides were doing it and we're all doing our own <laughs> modifications and just making it just a really, well, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I just have to tell you that it changed our lives, mine and Stevie on the Dean. Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but on the yeah. lower Dean, that was, yeah. we would live for takes on that right. fly. <laughs> anyway, sorry to cut you off. <laughs> that's no doubt at any time to hear stuff like that. That's wonderful. Uh, but anyway, Nick came up and he, he fished with, uh, he kind of bounced around. He fished with Ed, he fished with a, a couple other guys. He fished with me. And then when he got with me, we, you know, he's asking me a lot of questions like he does and I'm answering them. And finally he said, I think on the second day, he must have liked the way I was answering questions because he said, do you ever do any writing? And I said, well, I haven't, but I've kind of always wanted to. And, you know, for he goes, well, I, two articles, man. You write about whatever you want. And we'll, two articles. And I was just I was really excited about that. So I, I wrote he said, do you have pictures? And I said, heck, yeah, I have pictures. I thought I was a good photographer. And uh, <laughs> the first story I did, they didn't use any of my pictures. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> I better learn how to shoot some photos. So I did that. But so that was my first writing. So and I think that was 93. And then from there on, I started writing for a lot of the magazines. I never I was not a prolific writer and, and I never solicited it. It was always came to me, which was kind of cool. And uh, um, then pretty soon, some of my friends were like, dude, you need to write a book. You need to do a book. And uh, I've always loved teaching and talking. And I started, I did a lot of fly fishing clubs, you know, was, you know, the local, local guide. So the clubs would ask you in the winter to come do their meetings. And I'm sure you, I know you've done plenty of them. 
Um, and then after a lot of those meetings, like you need to write, a, I do my slideshow. You need to write a book. So, well, I guess I'm gonna write this book. And uh, got with uh, back then I was doing a lot with Tom Pirro uh, and his publications. And um, we, he, I think he came to me and he said, "Hey, you've been talking about writing a book. I'm starting a publishing company. Let's do it." And so I did it. And I. When when we were planning the book, I, I I knew what I wanted to do on my end. I didn't. It, this was going to be how to anecdotal. You're in the boat with me. We're going down the river. You're spending a day with me on the river. You're asking me whatever you want to ask me, and I'm telling you what I think is important. And I I always thought I always referred to it as. I was shooting from the hip. I, w I wasn't going to do a bunch of research because I'd already done 30 years of research, you know, whatever at that point, 20 years of research, right? Out on the river, living the life. And uh, I just did. So it was easy to write in that I just shot from the hip and poured it from my gut and, and just told the story. Um, how I, which on the back cover, I'm kind of proud of it. I think it was uh, uh, Bob Clay. He said that he goes, gosh, it's like it's, it was like I was in the boat with deck for the day. I'm like, right on. Yeah. He's taking me down the river. <laughs> that's yeah. how I felt when I was reading it. I love who did the diagrams because they are excellent. So that's uh, Greg Pearson. And uh, I was very fortunate because, yeah, w yeah. When, when we uh, he's an amazing artist. Oh, mm -hmm. my gosh. He's so good. In fact, now he's you know, he was a. Uh, Rocky Mountain Winston rep, SA rep, and all that. And he, he's retired from that, and he's gone full on with his art. He's just spectacular. This. So I was really lucky. And we had known each other because he used to come up to the Skagit back in the 90s. He would take a trip up there, and he was this dude. I would always, you know, we'd hit it off, and I'd always talk to him whenever he came up. And he was from Utah. And uh, when I came to Utah, of course, I looked him up, and it was easy to find him. And uh, when we did the book, I was so lucky to have him here because he's an amazing angler. He, he, he knows it as good as anybody. He's an absolute peer in casting and fishing. And uh, so to have him right here, not exactly in steelhead country, right? And I've got Greg Pearson doing my illustrations. So we went out to the, a few times, went out to the local park and just, you know, did casting stuff and he would take photos of me doing all these different casts and skating dry flies in a little sewage creek or something <laughs> and then, then do the illustrations from that but yeah super lucky with that that is hilarious he would just get you on the water any water to see and get a visual and then draw it. yeah 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 <laughs> well he would take photos yeah take photos yeah yeah so wait so he what year did this book come out do you remember the year that it... 2006 2006 okay tw wow my God, it's like, that's almost 20 years ago. I know. Isn't that crazy? It feels like it was yesterday. I know. I the quality serious. of it is as if it could be from yesterday. The flies. I mean, that was one of the things that really stuck with me also were your flies. I always felt like your flies were so classy. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, they're kind of timeless. This, you know, the stuff I do. That book has got to be one of the best selling steelhead books. I can't think of a steelhead book that would have done better can you um probably over over i don't know if, if trey's steelhead books sold more over time than mine did but i don't know my my uh i i and i say this humbly um we've sold a lot of those and uh i don't know i i it, it might rival as many as trey sold or ones I, I got a great email from him just a couple of years ago oh good and yeah, and he was telling me how much he loved that book, and he said that mine was better than his. <laughs> no, you can't compare them, but thank you. <laughs> I feel like his is such a great historical reference. It's his, yeah, mine tells you how to fish. Yeah, and he has that front section where it's good, and he tells you how to fish, but my my whole book's about how to do it, right? Right. So For what happened to your part, career yeah. after that book? Uh, oh, boy. So... I had, I had quit. Well, move, moving back, you know, I, I with all those river, all the closures and it, it was it, when I, I did. I worked on the Deschutes as well. Um, with I the did, Hazels. I don't know, nine or ten. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yep. Yep. And when it 
we started when it was just the Hazel. Oh, right. <laughs> and, the John, know, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Amy came along. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I did a lot of seasons there and learned a ton on the on the Deschutes. And I was there. Um, you know, you hate to look back, but I got to see some really good stuff on all those rivers, kind of the kind of the end of the really, really good stuff. And hopefully it all comes back. But you know, you you I remember going on the guiding on the the shoots. Went one time I went 30 consecutive days without a blank day. You know, just amazing. And then I had days where you would catch you know how when you when you get a steelhead, when one grabs your fly, it's like it's the easiest thing. It's the, such a positive thing. Boom, there it is. So why doesn't that happen in every run I fish? Right? You I had days out there where every stop we made, we'd hook them That's every ridiculous. all day long. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that was some good stuff. Um, where was I going with this? The book comes um, out and your career must have had a boom. Oh, my career. Yeah. So I had quit guiding full time right prior to the book coming out. Why? Why uh, had you quit? Well, so the I, I, I fell in love with this woman and life changed and I was the mobile one and I wanted to be with her. So I came to Utah, but it was easy to do because the Skazit was closed. The Skycomish was closed and I didn't want to go out and just be an Olympic peninsula guide with everybody else. I just didn't want to do it. So it was, it was easy to, to leave. So, um, and that's when I wrote the book, I wrote the book after all I, that book was all written in Utah. Once I got over here, I went back and guided one more season uh, on the Skagit left here and went and set up camp. And I think that was 2003. So my last full, full year on the Skagit was 2003. And then, and then, then closures started. It was just, it was back and forth and up and down. Then they really started getting close. So the timing was good there. Um, so what happened in my career after that? Well, these casting classes I do now, I'm, I'm a full-time firefighter, advanced EMT. So we work 48 hour shifts. Um, on my days off, I get to travel around the nation and Canada and teach uh, teach casting, do these two day casting clinics, and uh, um, they after that book came out, they were just I could go anywhere. It's like a Rolling Stone concert. Say that humbly, but it was like they would sell out in a day. The the shop would advertise it, and all the spots were filled. And they go, "Do you think you could do a third day too?" So I have six people in the class for the day class for, you know, each day. So there'd be 12 students for the weekend and they'd sell out and they go, can you, can you do eight and can you add a day? And that happened over and over and over and over. And it was because of that. And um, club meetings, everybody wanted me to come talk to their club. And then monetarily um, it was kind of nice because they, I, they were asking me to do their Christmas banquets and the Christmas banquets, you know, you always can, you <laughs> charge a little more money for those (laughs) (laughs) it's still chump change in the grand scheme of things but um you know in 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 our little fly fishing business but it all it all helps and it's fun and i just i i still to this day i just i love you know passion for steelhead i just i love it all so much i like talking about it still after all this time and doing it and the flies and casting and they just eat it up but i still feel like gosh i'd I should be paying you at the end of the day, you know, for all the fun that I had still feel that way. What about, what about moving from the Pacific Northwest? Have you had some sort of mourning? Have you had some sort of, do you look back and and miss it? And I ask selfishly because me being in Australia, I know I, even though I still live for the best parts of the year in Canada, I still yeah, mourn my I still mourn that, you know, my yeah. teens, my twenties, the steelhead, the wildness, the rain, the Pacific Northwest. What about you? Oh yeah, absolutely. No, for sure. It's, it, 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 it becomes part of the, for, for lack of a better term, the fabric of your being, um, um, just the smells and the feeling and that hu- cool humidity and, and the sounds of all the varied thrush singing and the robins and all of it um and the dankness of it the dark yeah i love it and i i do i do mourn a bit um i i will say though that i love where i am okay oh, I, I, 
I, I do love it. It's, it's wonderful. In fact, I can look out my door, out my front window and see moose and fox and elk and right like literally in my yard. So I love, I love it all. And it's, it's, it, it's nice to dry out a little bit, um, <laughs> you know, from being in that 300 days of dark wetness. Um, I do. One of the things I, when people say, what, what do you, do you miss the steelhead? Well, there's part of being up, being up guiding and being on the river every day. I I miss aspects of that of being so in tune with the river. It's like when I go steelheading now, and I go, I still go quite a bit. When I go, I show up to the river knowing something, having some knowledge uh, of how to swing the fly and what good water is. But I'm not in tune with that river like I was when I guiding every you know guiding every single day. I get up in the morning, oh dark thirty, step outside my cabin, smell the air, and know how our day was going to go. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a relationship. Um, I wonder totally. sometimes if we mourn the relationship more so than the experiences. That's kind of what I'm alluding to. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. To, to just to be at that, at that level and that in touch with that and having that relationship, you know, it's just different now. I can go to the river and I'm going to go to the, you know, do my grand ronde. I still guide some in the fall and oh, I do okay. uh, some the three day trips on the grand ronde. Two or th I, last year I did four of them back to back to back to back. And then this year I'm doing two and then I'm going to go to the Babine um, with one of my old clients is bringing me up there. And, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll be on the river for a week. I'll, I'll start, to, I'll start to get a, a feel for it again, a little bit, you know, in that little bit of time, but still nothing like that every day, all day, day after day. Um, and then I miss having, I miss going crabbing and cl digging clams and crabs and being, you know, right by the Puget Sound. And that's one thing I kind of miss having that right there. Um, but as far as, as far as uh, missing the guiding per se, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, get I, get little, I get a little taken. <laughs> yeah. You get it. Yeah. I did a lot of it and I'm okay. And with all these casting clinics I do, um, I'll, I do them almost year round. I've got my last one this year is in December, actually in Seattle. I'll be at, um, um, oh, he's one of my best friends. Um, Dave, Dave McCoy. Oh, in Washington. You know Dave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll go do my classes for him in December. And they usually start, I start in March and, you know, have one or every month or so and, and go all around and, and do those. So I'm actually, you know, when I was guiding, I was tell people when I guided, I, I guided the same guys every, you know, every, every year for the same four days. I only guided 20 people, <laughs> which I, of course I didn't, but yeah. now I'm, I, you know, I touch way more way more people with the casting clinics and yeah so yeah because i still hear you brought up all the time even i was just hosting a trip in montana and one of my guys had to leave early because he had to go to one of your classes yeah he went to my class on the yeah. snake yep <laughs> right. i was just up there and he said yeah he said that he had been with you yeah, yeah. so as far as did you tell her that and he goes of course we all we, <laughs> <laughs> you're doing a podcast i'm in your class i was with her yeah <laughs> um, without diving into anyone specifically why do you think, I, I just feel like you're the perfect person to ask this question to, why do you think the wards, again, back to the originals, why do you think so many, if not all of those guys have dropped off the face of, you know, being, or have stopped being public? Well, I, I, I hate to say it, but, and I really hate to say it, but steelhead fishing is dwindling and all the you know those those guys were those guys were were puget sound s river guys and uh and even on the you know the and everything's circumstantial too you know scott o'donnell's running a lodge on the granite run and still goes to alaska um ed had to go back to michigan or to wisconsin to take care of his uh ailing mother years ago and that kind of got him over there um but you know the all these guys claim to fame is steelheading and uh it's not 
it's not what it used to be. That's what I think part of that answer, part of that is. Did Thompson's ever... closed. Yeah. Did that Skaz put the fear? Light... Did that put some sort of fear into you as far as your own career? Did you start? I know for me it did big time. Oh, absolutely. I had to, I had no, to go. Okay, th- I see where this is going. What yeah. else do I enjoy about this? Oh, I enjoy education. And then that's where my career has since taken me. But what what about you? Did you get stuck in that box? Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I, again, by the time that I got stuff guiding for personal reasons, um, full time, I kind of missed it, but I, but, yeah, I missed it. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but now as you know, when I go now the, the Deschutes is having closures, who would have ever thought that, you know, so, so, you know, in retrospect and, and even now I'll look back and say, you know, my, cause there was a lot of people that, you know, that looked up to me and, and when they, when they saw me all of a sudden, I'm not guiding and I'm not on those rivers. I know that like, there was people that were angry for whatever reason. Why? If you, well, I think that they, it was, it, it, I think that some of them, and again, I say this humbly, but they, they, they looked at themselves at Dex leaving. What, 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 what's in, what's my destiny on these rivers? Is it really that bad? And they didn't understand that, you know, part of the reason I left was, for other life reasons, but, um, there was some of that and I had it and I know that cause I actually had people, some people tell me that, um, gosh, if you're leaving, what, what, what's going to happen? Is it, is it really that bad? So, um, but I did get out, I did get out. So when I said, so when I look back, I'm like, gosh, you know, my timing personally wasn't too bad to go start another career. And I got afloat on that career. And then I was able to go back and, you know, all my buddies at the fire department, they, they, we, we all have part-time jobs because we can, you know, we work two days on four days off. Um, but they work in ERs, they work at other part-time at other fire departments. They have landscaping businesses, they have snow removal, they have construction. I'm doing this pretty cool. I, yeah. So somebody pinch me. I'm still, I'm still neck deep in this little industry. Did you have a real down? This is again, another really personal question that I try not to hit anyone with until we've had, usually with podcasts in person, I go in the night before we have a few drinks, we hang out. Then the next day I'm comfortable to ask them really tough questions. And I'm going to ask you, did you have a point in your life where you had just hit absolute bottom? Um, and that that an ab- absolute bottom is a relative thing, right? It is one person, yeah, for sure. Uh, so I did have a time, and it is very personal. I had a time where the Skagit stuff was getting really tough. Even though they were open, I I I, I boast about having 30 days without a blank on the, on the Deschutes. I, I remember going 27 days on the Skagit during prime time with a blank every day for 27 days. Hard to be a cheerleader on day 24 when you just went 23 with nothing. Really hard on day 26 when you just went 25 with nothing. We're going to get them today. So that was going on. And I was getting divorced, a little eight-year-old girl, and trying to get to this other person. And really, really hard to get to that other person and deal with the other thing. And then my identity still then was, I was a steelhead fly fishing guide, and not just being pretty miserable actually <laughs> and really tough. So that would have been, that would have been my, my lowest point. So there was, it was kind of bittersweet, right? I'm getting to this, this, this person who I just was crazy about and we're just perfect for each other, but I can't get to her. And then dealing with, you know, the other and my child and all that. So yeah, that's a, yeah, that is a very personal thing, but I'm, you, you got it out of me, Oprah. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering if you were, I'm asking because I'm wondering if you were able to utilize fishing to help you pull it out. Because a lot of people right now are going through exactly oh. what you're talking about. You know, 
how did you, were you able to utilize fishing or the outdoors or was it truly just, cause I'm assuming you married the woman you're referring to as your now wife, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. We're, yeah. Mm-hmm. We're, yeah. We've been married since 2006. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. when she saw the book was successful, she, she said, well, okay, he's a keeper. I'm just <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he's roll. He's rolling in the books. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> rolling in the twenties. <20s. laughs> How did you get out of it? I guess. Cause I don't want to, I, I, we don't know each other enough for me to, to, to really poke and yeah, prod yeah, here, no, but how did you get out of it? Uh, sh- so, you know, the, for me, fishing is always there and yeah, is it super therapeutic? And I mean, I could, you know, again, back to the three hour thing we talk, I mean, I could go on and on and tell you all kinds of really cool stories of personal things that happened to me on the river through this and prior to that. And, um, uh, um, but the, 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 the big way that I got out of it was, and this is where fishing comes in. I being a steelheader. And having that perseverance and that belief and that discipline and nothing stops you and you go and you believe every step of the way all day long. That's when I said, you know what? I, I remember the moment I was up on the, the cabin and on, up on the Skagit and I just said, man, just just do your steelhead thing and go get this. Go get it done. Good point. And uh, yeah. Yep. And, and that's when I lifted myself up. And I said, this is just a big, long run, and I'm going to get down to the bucket and get that fish. So. (laughs) That is bloody spectacular. And you know what? You're right. I never even put two and two together as far as perseverance, but you're right. You wake up, it's cold, you're miserable. It's the last thing you want to do. You get out there anyway, and if you just keep working the run, eventually. Yep. You either get yep. to the end of the run or you hit the money. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And oh, when you get I to the end it. of the run without the money, you go, there's another run around the bend. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, that literally, literally had that, that, you know, you talk about the revelation, that thought and revelation, Just pick yourself up and go get this. And, you know, it all, and all of a sudden I'm in Utah <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm with her and sort of, and things are happening and, and uh and then all of a sudden one day i go gotta have a job (laughs) who's gonna i gotta have a job what the heck am i gonna do now yeah see i got here so that's why you know to make ends meet i went back and did another season on the skagit and uh and then after that i kind of did some odd stuff but i i didn't want to just have a job i need a career and uh so that, you know, in 1997, see, when I was in the Navy, we're all firefighters. You on a ship, everybody's oh, a firefighter. Interesting. Okay. Right? So you do some pretty extensive, you know, there's they, certainly the fire guys, but everyone has to be trained in firefighting when you live on a ship. So I did quite a bit of training early in my Navy years uh, before we, we started deploying on the on the carrier. And it was pretty cool. I was pretty intrigued with aspects of it and then in 1997 i distinctly remember kind of getting a little seven-year itch in the guiding thing going am i doing the right thing and I, you know i never planned on just riding off into the sunset as a guide i knew something was else was out there for me and uh um, i thought well maybe i'll try and get a fire job well at that time that lasted for a minute you know because I was just, it, things were going so well and so successful. And then, then I actually started having guys working for me on the Skagit, Ed being one, because, you know, I couldn't take any, take on anyone. It was just me. So I'm turning all these people away and sending them to other guys. I'm like, oh, I could get a piece of that too. So I had Keith Balford and Ed Ward working for me then. So no fire, no fire job. But when I came here, started thinking about it. Gosh, maybe I'm not too old. I can, I can do this. And, and then I would have insurance. I would have a retirement. And uh, so I used that same, same logic. And I distinctly said, okay, you don't know anything about this. Uh, you, and, the, and it's super competitive back then. This is like right after 9-11. So everybody wanted to be a firefighter. Um, I just thought, okay, steelheader in you. Go get it. And I did it. And I went to these schools and I did all this stuff. And I'm with all these young 20 year olds. And I think I was at 38 or 39. And I remember I went to one of the 
battalion chiefs who was running this EMT school I was taking. I, before, I said, before I commit to any of this stuff, would you just tell me, am I, am I too old? Am I too late? And he said, he looked around and he goes, if it was up to me, we wouldn't hire anyone under 34 <laughs> just for the maturity level. You yeah, know? good. And so, yeah, and he's like, just come, just do it. So I did it and I got the job and, and I got a couple more years to go. I'm, you know, I'm getting old. It's getting harder and How whatnot. How old are you? I, I got it. I just turned 60. Yeah, yeah. So you're looking at, you're looking at slowing down. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah From a work sure. stance. I mean, I would never say, I find that people who are retired are busier than ever, but you're ready to slow oh, down. Oh gosh. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. At the fire department. Yeah. I'm not going to be there forever, but when I get done with that, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, on like Donkey Kong, I'm back in this fishing business even more because now I do these, you know, I do my clinics and fly around and do my classes and I have to weave those in to, you know, work. specific times and work it around my work and have it on. Ha, yeah, ha, it, it, our, my four days off falls on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You know, that's a premium. So then I don't have to take any leave, but there's only so many of those. But when I'm out of the fire, I can. You know, I can do one a month whenever I want, wherever I want. So, because I enjoy doing that. Yeah. Right. And the pay is not too bad. You know, it's worth it to mm -hmm. go do that and do the weekend of that. Yep. And I can do club meetings when they want. And I can even do a little moonlight guiding if I want. Right. So, yeah. So I can write can... more. That's exactly right. I, I, and one of the reasons, just so you know, that I've deliberately left out all the technique talk is because, A, I want people to buy your book. It's spectacular. Um, mm -hmm. B, I want to do this again and C, I want to do it in person and maybe even yeah. with, with video. So, um, on oh, cool. that note, cause I'll let you, I know you've got lots going on. Um, where yeah. can people find you these days? Okay. So probably the, the, the best way to, to find me is to message me on Instagram, deck Hogan. That's all it is. Deco at deck Hogan. Beauty. Can, is that what you mean? How to contact me? Well, yeah. Or the website, where can people buy your book? I, book your workshops? Yeah. So um, uh, unfortunately that you talk about the book and the, the book's out of print. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, I know Tom was doing some black and white ones. It's a long involved story. You know, I did another big book, the a fly time book. I don't know if you, oh, really no, I did not yeah, know. Yeah, we self published it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send where, you one. Where can people buy and, that? So that's another one that's kind of out of print, uh, oh, but some, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know it's hard. Well, and that complements the COVID too, because our, all the, the, the printing places we were going to, they're all closed down and shut down. You know, we, we might explore it, but um, yeah, you would, you would like the book. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Or even ebooks. E but uh, yeah, ebooks. Yeah, I, I, I need to do some, some, there's some things we need to do for sure. Um, we put so much work into that book. It's like 400 pages, all color. We, well, I'm super proud of it when you see it. Um, um, but that one, if you, a lot of the shops still have a few floating around. Okay. If you, if, yeah, if, if people want, you can just phone some shops around Seattle and just see, you know, see if they have them. I know the Avid Angler bought a ton of them from us over, over and over and over. And then Creekside Anglers in Issaquah, Washington. They bought a lot from us and they might still have some and, you know, and then no promises, but we're, we're going to, me and Marty Howard did it together. So we're, we're going to try and do something with it. Excellent. And then pass it for steelhead, you know, good luck trying to find it. Yeah, you know, actually, that's a good point. What about, yeah, um, yeah. do you have a website yet? No, I never have had a website. No, never did. Okay, so Instagram, I'll link you. I don't you even know what I would do with it. Okay. <laughs> well, I want. I would love to take one of your clinics. I think it would be absolute. I think it would oh, be a blast, and I'd yeah. learn a ton. We could learn from each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, uh, um, the closest I'd be. Well, we'll talk about it, but um, you know, I do. I do go to Seattle a couple times a year, usually in Portland. And the one up in Jackson is cool. You should come to that one, and I'll tell you why. Because the venue is so cool. Right. The place I teach, the, the the spot I teach on is just wonderful. This big riffle is just absolutely beautiful. And, um, you, you know, when you teach casting, it's nice to be able to do both sides of the river at the same spot. So we just wade back. It's shallow enough that you wade out and cast back in. So you can do river right, river left. And there's plenty of room for six people. And it's just beautiful. 
and while you're doing it, there's cutthroats and browns rising around on oh, whatever's hatch. And this, you've got that, yarn that, on. You, you guys, <laughs> yeah, and you got yarn on, yeah, and they're grabbing it. Yep. It's torture. Um, are you, when yep. are you going to the bad baby? Well, uh, October 3rd. We'll be there. Come on by for a barbecue or something or a beer. Well, we just might do that. I'm dead yeah. serious. I don't extend just, that if no, I don't mean it. I'm dead no, serious. No, no, I know. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we never met each other, but don't you feel like we know each other? I feel it's ridiculous at this point, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, yeah, for sure. <laughs> come on by you can meet the yeah, family cool. and it'd be good to catch okay. up well, we'll be in touch and yeah we'll do it we'll do it i can almost guarantee that will happen good i'll be there yeah. mm -hmm. um, okay yeah. well look i'll link all this up i'll let you get back to your beautiful wife and um yeah. is there anything that i've left i mean i've left out a bunch but is there anything in particular you'd like to mention that i've left out uh not necessarily other than that i would like to do 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 some more of this with you another another one a part two at some point some right. point i love i love talking about fishing you know, the, the technical stuff and presentation. And that's when I start spitting at the spit flies and. <laughs> Be careful what crazy. you wish I for, do. because and I, I will know. make sure that if we're going to do a technical podcast, I will have reread your book front to back. And, yeah, cool. and I'm, awesome. I'm dead serious. Be careful what yeah. you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. Okay. To awesome. be continued. Thank you so much. Okay. Dick. Thank you, April. Don't hang up.